once, twice. Sold. All right, so what I'd like to do is spend this la last uh, 20 minutes of this morning or so uh, talking about what are kind of some of the goals of psychology. And then I'm going to go through what a couple pseudo-psychologies to kind of show how um, to kind of differentiate what we try to do in psychology versus other forms of thought about predicting behavior and emotional states. And what I hope to show in that, that, that this section is that um, even within false psychologies, as they call them, there sti still can be ingrained in actual factual information. Uh, it's just the interpretation is usually what goes wrong. Okay, but let's start with what are kind of some of the goals. If you were to ask a psychologist, what do you do? This, these are the things that that he or she would try to express. Okay, and I'm going to use kind of a depression as an example to kind of go through these four goals. The first thing that we want to do as psychologists is we want to describe some psychological or mental phenomenon. So for example, we can look into the world and we find that there is this cluster of people who for a abnormal amount of time, six weeks or greater, tend to have sleep disturbances, they tend to have a low affect, low motivation, they tend to have thoughts of hopelessness and helplessness, and we start to try and under describe this group of people, okay, in, in, in kind of this way, okay, and then we want to give that some type of label, so we'll label it, for example, this, this is depression, because they're they have a depressed emotional, psychological, and physical affect about themselves. Okay? So the next thing we want to do is we then want to understand this group of behaviors and mental processes. We want to understand uh, the biological processes that are in play, what's going on in the brain and the hormones and that kind of stuff. We want to know what's going on psychological. What type of thought processes do they have? Do they have logical thought processes going from A to B, or do they have cyclical processes that reinforce their negative thoughts or something like that? We want to know their thinking. Okay. We want to know their social life. Okay. How are they living? Are they different to the, uh, social, economically, family-wise? Uh, relationship-wise, we want to know everything that 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 contributes to that cluster of behaviors and and mental processes. Okay. Then we take it a step further. Now that we we can describe it and we can understand it, the next thing we want to do is predict it. So who is most likely to end up with this? thing we call depression? What variables need to be in place for someone to experience depression? Okay. And then the last part, of course, is we want to control it. Obviously, for depression, there's good reasons to control it. We want to alleviate the depressive symptoms, right? Um, but also, if we're studying something like happiness, okay, control looks like how can we promote happiness by controlling it, okay? So those are kind of the four goals of psychology, and we kind of go through all of these processes whenever we have some type of question about the way people behave or the way people think, okay? There are other camps. What makes psychology unique as a study is psychologists use the scientific method to try and objectively observe and understand and predict behaviors, okay? But there's other types of psychologies which we tend to call pseudo-psychologies. Pseudo means false. And so um, 
any pseudopsychology is anything such as clairvoyance, um, fortune telling, um, anything that tries to predict a future behavior or mental process or relationship. Okay. Now, if if you want to make some good money, okay and you know someone who is clairvoyant or somebody like that or a fortune teller and you think they're really good, at the University of Wisconsin-Madison they have this panel that has a, a magician, psychologist, an attorney, and then some just people from the community that sit on this panel. And if you, and if you can predict behavior, someone's behavior using uh, fortune telling or what not, they'll give you some money. Okay, this started in 1972 with twelve thousand dollars. It is now up to two hundred and seventy-three thousand dollars. Okay, because each year they add to that pot. Okay, and it's at two hundred and seventy-three thousand dollars because no one has ever been able to predict behavior using these pseudo psychologies okay another thing you can do if you don't want to go to that extent is if you want to set up a tent on a Saturday and and get some extra money there's a book called the real Sherlock Holmes okay it's under a hundred pages it's a really easy read and it tells you all of the tricks and methods that fortune tellers use and whatnot in order to um, get your money, okay? Uh, so if you want to do that and make some extra change on the weekend, it's the real Sherlock Holmes. It's a really easy read, okay? But let's talk about it's. I think it's important to talk about these because they are based on some actual stuff about human behavior and mental processes, okay? So the first one we're going to talk about is phrenology. Now, phrenology isn't something that's really popular today. It was really popular in the 1800s and the early 1900s. Okay. But what phrenology was based on is that, like, bumps and dents in your head denoted some personality feature. Okay. So, for example, if you had a bump or a dent right here, that meant you were really good at drawing. Um, if you had something up here, it meant that you were really good at data mining. And of course, everybody starts rubbing their head, right? <laughs> hmm, what am I? Okay. <laughs> now, the thing that I should say is that the bumps and lines in your head actually tell you nothing about <laughs> personality <laughs> and behavior. But where does the idea come from? Okay. The idea came from the idea that certain parts of the brain control certain parts of behavior and mental processes. Okay? And what these early individuals observed is that when a baby came out of mom's womb, their head was very soft. Okay? So what they believed is, is as the head hardened, it formed to the confluence of the brain. And since areas of the brain had different functions, you should be able to tell by touching different areas of the skull what the brain is telling the person about who they are. Okay. Um, we, we, we know that that doesn't happen. But let's talk about some facts of phrenology. First of all, the thing about phrenology is, is it, it was huge, especially in Western culture. In the 18th and early 19th hundred, when we didn't have DJs, if you really wanted to do a smacking party, you would call in a phrenologist who would come to the party and fill everybody's head. This is how big this thing got. Okay. Um, but despite the skull not saying anything, they were actually on to something. Because we do know that areas of the brain have certain locations of function. Okay? So we know that your mom was right. She, you, she did have eyeballs in the back of her head. In fact, we all do because we see 
vision is processed by the occipital lobe, which is in the back of the brain. Okay? Spatial areas, auditory areas, cognitive thinking, frontal lobe, emotions. So we do have some localization of functioning within the brain. So they weren't completely wrong. It's just their interpretation. Okay? So this is, I, I you start with this one because it's a good example of where they were onto something, but then they kind of curved off um, into a, a, probably a wrong direction. Okay? Um, the next one that I like to bring up is palm reading. Palm reading started in, at least in Western culture, about a thousand years before the Greeks came along. Okay? It was during a time period where a large number of people saw no difference between human beings and nature. Okay? And what they started to notice is you could tell the health of like a tree or a plant by looking at its exterior, looking at its bark, looking at the rings on the tree, looking at how the leaves are wilting. You could look at the exterior of that tree and you could get a general sense of the health and vitality of that tree. Okay. These folks extended this because it usually is the most used part that starts to kind of weather first. And they noted that the first thing, the, the most used, ooh, <laughs> the most used part of the human body is the hands. Okay? So they started to think that just like the bark on a tree or the rings in a tree, um, that the lines in the hands must represent something about the health and the, the abilities of the person. Okay? So what they came up with is, and over the centuries, is that different lines, uh, this is the line of life, this is fate, all of these different things, and predict how long you'll live, how long you'll be in love, blah, blah, blah. Okay? Uh, from a scientific perspective, there's no evidence that the lines in your hands mean anything. Unless you have like a scar, okay, or something like that. But is there evidence that we do can see the internal workings of a person by looking at their external features? Okay, and because my study a lot of my studies does with relationships, that's the one I'll use. I also like this, even though I have to go through you guys to get to the door, but uh, I also like using this example because I get to prove women are bigger perverts than men. Okay? <laughs> and this is how I'm going to do this. Okay? <laughs> okay? Stereotypically, stereotypically, when a man is in a social situation, what parts of the body is he looking at on a female? Stereotypically. You can say it. The breasts or the booty, right? One of the two. Okay. One eye on one and the other on the other. That's how it works, right? Okay. Okay. Stereotypically, where are women looking? The face, yeah. No, right, right. You're looking at the face because you want to know how sensitive and cute and how luscious they are, right? That, right? Okay. So, so let's test this hypothesis, okay? What, what we're going to do is we're going to put glasses on you that track where the pupil of your eyes fixate on and track, okay? And then we're going to put you in a social situation and we're going to record where your eyes track. Okay? And it has some interesting results because stereotypically, men do believe that they spend the majority of their time looking at the breasts and the butt. And women do believe that they're looking at the guy's face. Okay? But that's not actually what the brain is processing. Okay? Men actually spend the majority of the time, greater than 80% of the time, 
tracking the female's eyes and lips. They actually only spend, processing-wise, less than 10% of the time on the breast and the butt. Okay? Now women. <laughs> Guess where you're looking at? <laughs> you're spending the majority of the time right here in the lower crotch hip area of the mouth. You spend about 60% of the time <coughs> tracking across from here to here. You spend the next amount of time tracking the shoulders, from shoulder to shoulder, and then you only spend a little bit of time actually on the face. Okay? <laughs> now, <laughs> I agree, right? <laughs> now, <laughs> now, last time, now, now we have to try and understand why, <laughs> okay, and in my last class they all laughed at this, but what we determined or what we think is going on is that women are actually making some measurements, not those kind of <laughs> measurements. <laughs> <laughs> Not that measurement. <laughs> but when we watch the tracking of the eyes, we actually watch you go from the edge of the male's waist to the other edge and back and forth. And same with the shoulders. You go back and forth. And what we think is going on is you're actually measuring the width of the hip and the width of the, width of the shoulders, okay? Why do you think you're doing that? <laughs> What's that? A suitable mate. The more sturdy a male's trunk area is, the more the more likely he is to impregnate, okay? Uh, because he will ejaculate stronger and harder and longer if he has a sturdy trunk, okay? The shoulder, we think, has to do with dominance, okay? Even when we look at face attraction, attractive faces, even when a woman says she wants a sweet, sensitive guy, she still will rate dominant faces as more attractive than the sweet, sensitive guy faces, okay? And we know that shoulder width is a notation of dominance. And so we think, one, you're tracking, is he going to be a good, productive mate? And does he have sufficient uh, dominance to be my partner, okay? So... <laughs> So, that B is nuts. So now, why are guys looking at the face more? Okay. Well, we think we're, they're looking at the eyes because there's an association between how white your eyes are, the whiteness part, and your health. The whiter the eyes, the more healthy the person. The more dark they become, more yellowed they become, more red they, they become, the sicker or unwell the person becomes. And again, we know from ratings of attractive faces, we can, bless you, bless you. We can take the same face and we can either whiten or darken the white parts of the eye and we'll rate them more or less attractive based on how white the eye is. <laughs> okay. So there's that. The lips. Why are we looking at lips? <laughs> the redder the lips are, the healthier the person. <laughs> yeah. So, so we think that that's why. So going back to palm reading, using this example 
truly we are looking at external features of the person and determining internal physiological and psychological states. Okay. So just like in palm reading, we do the same thing. Okay. It's just when the palm readers they were looking at the wrong wrong things, but there are physical aspects of a person that we can tell about their internal state. Okay. So that's palm reading. Graphology uh, is the notion that the way you sign your name tells you something about your personality. So if you do long lines, it means you're outgoing, I think. And low dips means you're a deep thinker. I don't know. But anyways, is there any association between your signature and personality and whatnot? The answer is no. Okay. But is writing a good predictor of behavior? Yes, because you tend to have the same writing regardless of situations. Okay, So while graphology is not good at determining personality traits, it's very good at determining things like forgery okay, and things like that. So again, based in fact, it's something stable about the person but it just doesn't predict what people think it does. Okay. And then the last one that we'll talk about is astrology. Okay. Astrology is that you have a sign that tells you something about you, but those signs are symbols of the star constellation in the sky at the time that you were born. Okay. So I was born in July. That makes me a Leo. That should have meant that the star constellation of Leo was in the sky when I was born. Okay. Now, the problem with astrology is the astrological maps that were used were developed 10 to 12,000 years ago. Okay. In the last 10 to 12,000 years, the stars constellations have moved by six months. Okay? Meaning that when I was born, it was not the Leo star constellation that was in the sky. It was actually the Aquarius. And if I was really to use this literally, I'm not a Leo, I'm an Aquarius. Okay? So if you've been reading your sign based on your birth date, you've been actually reading the wrong one. You should have read the one that is six months later because that's your actual sign. Okay. But people really hold on to this notion of astrology and something about when I was born uh, determining something about uh, my behaviors and my mental processes. Okay. While astrology is not so correct, is there something about the time and place in which you were born? Okay. We can look at broad statistics. Okay. So, for example, the answer is yes. And we can look at certain professional sports to see this. So, for example, we can look at hockey and baseball, pro hockey and pro baseball as an example. Okay. Most professional hockey players that are really, really good were born in January and February. Okay? So there's a notion that people who are born in January and February naturally are better hockey players. Okay? But if we were to make that assumption, we would be wrong. Okay? It actually has to do with the cutoff point at which they accept new pupils into hockey okay and because of the way the cutoff date is made it's actually being born in January and February gives you an eight month advantage practice advantage over your same aged peers okay and that eight months worth of practice is what pushes them over the edge okay some other good examples are uh, of place and time is uh, Bill Gates. Okay? 
everyone assumes that Bill Gates is this very was this naturally born intelligent person that saw things in a new and different way that no one else saw them okay that would actually be a semi false assumption okay back when Bill Gates was um, in junior high and high school when you used a computer you used to use this little time card and you put this time card into the computer and you were only allowed a certain amount of time on that computer. Usually it was one to three hours per week. Okay? And that's all that you would be allowed on that computer. This was obviously before the days of personal computers, so understand this. Okay? Bill Gates was born of privilege. Okay? His parents bought the computers for his junior high and high school with one caveat. Bill Gates would not have any time limitations on the computers. He could play the computers as much and whenever he wanted to. Okay? <coughs> what this meant is, is that by the time Bill Gates was 17, 18 years old, he had clocked more computer time than most doctors in computer sciences had. Okay? So... Is Bill Gates this? So he, he is an example of how time and place determine success. Is he incredibly motivated? Of course he is. But it was the advantage that he had based on his time and place and history that really made Bill Gates who Bill Gates is. Okay? And we can see these examples. So astrology is a very attractive thing because we see all of these examples of when people are born and it's associated with these outcomes and this time and place when people are born but again when we start to look at it closer we start to see that it's a lot more complicated than the what stars are in the sky when one is born okay the other thing that I would like to say, and it's going back to my first point in the class, is if you use any of these methods and they work for you, <coughs> don't stop using them. Okay? If they work for you and they bring meaning in your life, that's all that matters. I'm only bringing these up to show how ways of thinking cannot be totally correct, but they can at the same time. Does that make sense? Okay. All right, so one question is, is I talked about the real Sherlock Holmes and stuff, but how is it that people kind of believe in fortune tellings and fall into these things? And there's really three things that are at play. Uh, the first one is uncritical acceptance. Okay. This is the tendency to believe positive and flattering descriptions of yourself, okay, in the general, okay. So, um, uncritical acceptance is something like this. I'll, I'll, I'm going to pick on you, okay. If I came up to you and I went, I think you're a beautiful and smart woman, would you be kind of like, no, okay. You would kind of accept that, right? But what if I came up to you and said, you're a beautiful, smart woman because you read the material before you came to class. You were looking things up. Your hair's really nice. You look really good in that shirt. Your eyes are popping. Your lips... Aha, uh -huh, exactly. <laughs> See? See? She would believe the vague... But what did she start doing when I started to provide details? He, he's full of shit, right? <laughs> okay, let's be honest. Okay, it's like when people start to give us very specific reasons why, we start to not believe them. Okay, and that's a key thing to keep in mind is if you want to really get someone to believe who they are, don't give them specifics, you give them generals, okay? 
And if you notice, that's what most personality tests do. They give you this general trait like you're extroverted. That means you're outgoing. But it really doesn't give you any specific reason why you're extroverted. Okay? And those types of things. So those are examples of how uncritical acceptance, when it's put in the generals, we're more likely to accept. But when people really start giving specifics, we stop <laughs> believing it. Right? Okay? The other thing is, is something we call confirmation bias. This is tendency to look for information that confirms our ideas and expectations and ignore or completely not even recognize information that does not confirm our beliefs and ideas. Okay? In the lab, it looks something like this. We're going to take a person and we're going to take people they'll interact with during their day, like their boss and maybe their spouse. Okay? And what we're going to tell their boss and their spouse is we're going to say, give them equal amount of praise and criticism. Okay? So give five of each. Okay? And what we're going to do as people randomly come into the lab that morning, we tell them one of two things. We tell them, you're going to have a great day. <laughs> or we're going to tell them they're going to have a crappy day. Okay? And then we bring them in the next day and we ask them, what did you remember you experienced the day before? Okay? And fitting the confirmation bias, the people who are told they were going to have a crappy day usually don't remember one good thing that they were told during that day. But they tend to remember almost every piece of criticism they heard that day. People who were told they were going to have a good day only heard one or two of the criticisms, but they heard most of the good stuff. Okay? And this is an example of confirmation bias. Okay? Is we tend to look for information that only confirms our expectations. Okay? And we experience this every day. Okay? Let's say you're going to work or you're going to school in the morning. Your kids were late. They were pain in the necks because they couldn't decide what to wear and they threw their breakfast everywhere. You're going to work. You spill hot coffee on you and you get cut off. What kind of day are you having so far? What kind of day do you have for the rest of the day? Bad. Okay? It's a natural example of confirmation bias. Okay. When you're told in your, your, I forget what they're called, in the newspaper, your, your uh, horoscope, okay, that you're going to have a certain type of day, what people will naturally do is they'll start to look for things that are going to confirm and sometimes completely not experience or ignore things that don't confirm that horoscope, okay? And so we have the uncritical acceptance at play, and now we're going to have confirmation bias that's going to play into that. And then the last part is more of a general thing, and it's called the Barnum effect, okay? And it comes from the Barnum Circus. I can't say that without that mumma. -ma. <laughs> I don't know why. But in their circus, what they believed is that they needed something for everyone. So they needed something for single people, married people, families, kids, old people, young people. They needed something for everyone. Okay? And what we find is, is that by describing things in general terms, okay, so you are going to be happy today you're going to experience wealth today. There's something for everybody when you say something like, you're going to be happy today. Okay? There's something for everyone when you say, you're going to experience wealth today. And so when we have that something for everything one language, that also plays into why people believe and... and get caught up into these different methods of thinking and fortune telling and all these kinds of things. 
Okay. So from a scientific perspective, this is why we tend to um, fall into that category. But the other thing that, that I'll say too is even in this class, if I do that, you should call me on it. Okay? Because I can talk in really general terms and you go, oh, that's cool. So if you have a question or you go, that's a bunch of crock, <laughs> you should challenge me and ask for the details, right? You should ask me for the counter information. You should say, that could apply to everybody, but I know everybody is different, so it shouldn't, okay? And that's really how we should look at behavior and mental processes when we're evaluating when someone says this system works, okay? For example, with our ECE students, someone can come in and say, you know, for $5,000, you can implement this great and wonderful program and it will solve all your child's behavioral problems, okay? You probably get weekly emails for programs like that, probably. And what I hope you do using this information is you'll critically analyze it and go, why? Why, why, why? And what are the bad parts? Because there's always a negative impact. Okay? So let's see. There was supposed to be something at 11, wasn't there? A field trip? Okay. And they didn't show up? Let me go ask Elsa.